it together, all right? 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. That's why we have this series. That's why we're having this series about Bethany needs you. Everybody is a part of it, and we need every person who knows Jesus Christ and is connected with Bethany to be a part of it. And today we want to talk about Bethany needs you to share in 2022. Now, my key verse for today is this. It says, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Make, Lord, make the Lord Jesus number one in your heart. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. I was just a teenager. We had a boys club at church called Christian Service Brigade, and it was our teenage group, and I brought my buddies with me. And they had a devotional time at the close of every one. And then after that, one of my friends that I brought with me, his name was Dennis also. Dennis came to me, and, and, and Dennis says, hey, could you tell me more about how to be saved? And I drew a blank. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> after all, I was just a teenage kid in, in the club like he was. I said, come on, let's go back to the, the leader, Roy. He can tell you. He said, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't want to talk to him. I just thought maybe you could tell me. That was the day I realized I was not prepared to share my faith. And this verse is actually saying, be prepared to give the reason of your hope. I call that sharing. We need to be prepared. And so today I want to talk about the Apostle Paul. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Jesus story, and he gives it to us in a nutshell. And, and, and you might want to read these verses over and internalize them because he tells us the essence of what you need to share. He says, now brothers, I want to remind you of the good news. The word gospel means good news. The good news is that Jesus is alive. Amen? In fact, that's what this whole chapter 15 is going to be about. Jesus rose from the dead. Because he rose from the dead, he can give that life to you. So that when you die, you can raise from the dead in the rapture to go to be with God forever. This is good news. This is good news. And so he said, I shared with you, I'm going to remind you, I shared with you the good news. He says here, I preached it to you. Now, you'll notice here, I have a pulpit sitting there, and it's overlooking. I think, actually, these are our pews. I just put that pulpit up here, and, well, actually, I took a Photoshop picture and put it in there, okay? We don't have a picture like that. But anyway, when you see, you see the word preached, you think of what I'm doing right now, that I'm either preaching at you because you're feeling uncomfortable, <laughs> or I'm preaching to you because, oh, man, I love what this guy's saying, you see? Some of you say, he's just preaching over me. <laughs> I didn't get it at all. <laughs> anyway, you think of what's going on here as preaching, but let, let me tell you, there were no churches when Paul was preaching. There were no pulpits. He didn't even have an open Bible. Preaching here is just sharing, just telling the story. He's just, it's sharing. So, so he, we call that preaching when, you're, when you Put sharing the story with the good news of the gospel, it's preaching. And so some of you are preachers and you don't even know it because you're sharing the story. And when you do, you're a preacher. Listen, he says here, the gospel I preach to you. He goes on and he says, what you have received, uh, what you, <clears throat> on which you've taken your stand, and by this gospel, this good news, you were saved. You're saved. I love that word saved, rescued, delivered. See, you were drowning in your sin and the life preserver of Jesus Christ was thrown to you and you received him and you climbed upon the, the, the life preserver of Jesus and God pulled you out of your sin and, and he set you on solid ground, on the rock. Our God is the rock. And, and now you, you are on your way to heaven. Listen, 
He said, this is, this is the good news that was shared, and it saves. And he goes on and he says, and you f hold firmly to the word I preach. Now we come back to the Bible. The words, he was speaking words. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the Apostle Paul was reflecting back upon those passages of scriptures that he'd learned in Sabbath day school. And he is now pulling those from his memory and he's giving the word of God. He says, otherwise you would have believed in vain. He says, here's the key. You have to believe in the message. And if you believe in the message and then you turn your back on the message, of the resurrection of Christ, you have not really believed. Belief is the key to the whole story, the whole story. Then he adds this. For what I received, I received this message from God, I passed on. I call that sharing, sharing. When my friend Dennis came to me and said, hey, can you tell me how to be saved? And I couldn't pass it on. I couldn't share what I had because I wasn't prepared to share it. He says, for what I received, I passed on. I shared it. We have the only message of hope in this gloomy, dismal world in which we live. And we need to be prepared to share it, to share it. He says, for what I, I received, I passed on to you, first of all, of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. He mentions, listen, we're sinners. That's the starting point. Why is that the starting point? Because if I'm not a sinner, I don't need a Savior. But if I am a sinner, then I need a Savior. And so we start with the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's what he said, that Christ died for those shortcomings in our lives. The fact that we don't measure up. What do you mean, measure up to what? Well, God's standard is pretty, pretty clear. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So I'm going to ask right now, how many here are perfect? Would you please raise your hands? Hey, at home, I see your hands aren't raised either. Because <laughs> none of us are perfect. We all fall short. How about this? Here's the standard. Be holy as God is holy. Uh, will the person that's perfectly holy please raise their hand? See, it doesn't happen. As soon as you realize, I am not what I should be, you need a Savior. And that's what he's saying here. Christ died for all of our shortcomings. And it says, listen, and he was buried. He put them to death and he buried our shortcomings. They're gone. They're taken away. And it says, then he was raised on the third day. We got the resurrection involved here. And he says, this is all according to the Scriptures. And he comes back to the Bible. That's why we are a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. Because it's all according to the Scriptures. We build our faith on the forever settled, sure Word of God. That's where we build our lives. He says, then in this Jesus story, this is Paul telling us the Jesus story. He appeared... He appeared to Peter and then to the 12, and after that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time. And then that, he has this, most of whom are still living. Now, that's still living when he wrote it, not still living today, okay, not when we read it. What he's saying is there are plenty of eyewitnesses to this, and nobody is discrediting this story because there's too many witnesses to the fact. He said, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism. He's saying that they died. When it talks about a believer's death, often it talks of him as if he's fallen asleep and that Jesus is going to return and awake him and take him back to heaven with him. And it says, then he appeared to James and then to all of the apostles. He says, he's listing all the people here that he can think of. And then he adds this, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Wow, what do you mean by that? Well, he's really talking about how he appeared. He wasn't like the other disciples. They all walked with Jesus for the three years of his ministry. 
You know, they saw him perform the miracles, and they, they, they were with him when he preached the Sermon on the Mount, and they were with him when he changed the water to wine, and he, they were with him uh, when he did all the wonderful things he did, spit on the ground, anointed a man's eyes with, with the spittle, and, and told him to go and see. They saw all that. He didn't. He said, no, I, I, I became a follower of Jesus, kind of out of sync with all the rest. He says, let me tell you my story. It's recorded in the book of Acts three times. Three times. And Acts chapter 9 says, meanwhile, while the church was growing, and it's, it's growing every day, people are accepting Christ, being baptized, and joining the church. It says, meanwhile, Saul, that's Paul's name before his conversion, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters in the synagogue, uh, 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 to the synagogue of Damascus so that he, if he found any there who belonged to the way. Now the way is, <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The early Christian believers were not called Christians. That happens later at the city of Antioch. They were called Christians first at Antioch. At, at the beginning, they were called the people of the way because they thought Jesus was the only way. Huh, that's me. Jesus is the only way. I'm, I'm one of those people of the way. I'm also a Christian. I go by both. I go by a lot of names. I'm a believer. I'm one who trusts in God. There's a lot of names. I, I, I'm a, a saint. I go, nobody ever calls me Saint Dennis. <laughs> Probably because they know my background. But if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're, the Bible calls you a saint. You're a saint, okay? You don't have to go through some canonization process. You accept Jesus into your heart and you're a saint. There's a lot, of, a lot of terms used. Here, it's the people of the way. He was getting letters so he could go round up the people of the way, the Christians, and incarcerate them and, and actually punish them for following Jesus. That's called persecution. He's a persecutor. He says, I asked for letters in the synagogue of Damascus and so that if any were found who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them to prison in Jerusalem, to Jerusalem. And so as he was on his way to Damascus, on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now get up and go to the city you must, and you will, will, will be told what you must do. And so he gets up from the ground. He's blind. They lead him by the hand into the city. A man by the name of Ananias gives him his sight back and commissions him to go preach to the Gentiles. What a conversion experience, huh? It didn't happen to me like that. Pfft. Probably didn't happen to you like that either. You didn't get a flash of light, knock you off your feet blind for three days until somebody gave your sight back? Mm -mm. You, you probably had a different story, but uh, Paul tells that story in, in the book of Acts chapter 9. Then in the chapter 22, the story's told all over again. Paul goes back to Jerusalem, and, and they're about to they kick him out of the, out of the temple, and, and the Romans have him, and, and they're going to take him into the barracks. He says, wait a minute, I've got to preach to the people. And he turns to the people, and then Paul said, I am a Jew. Born in Tarsus of Sicily, uh, Sicilia. I, I persecuted the followers of this way. There it is again, the way people. I was after those people who were following Jesus. I were, he's the followers of the way to their death. You see, he was trying to capture, to get them punished, guilty of blasphemy, and actually have them killed. Persecutor of the church. He was, I was arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison. Also, the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them right here in Jerusalem. I obtained these letters from them that their brothers in Damascus and went there, bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And then he says, in about noon... <laughs> As I came to Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard the voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I ask? And the Lord, the Lord says to him, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I ask? Get up. 
the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told uh, that all that has been assigned to you. I've got a purpose for your life. Do you get the point here? God saved him for a purpose. God saved you for a purpose. Whew. Isn't that amazing? And so we, uh, Apostle Paul, you know, he goes on his missionary trips, and he's finally back in Jerusalem. He's standing before a king called Agrippa. And before King Agrippa, he had to tell him his story one more time. Here he is telling his story. I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. A few verses down later, he said, About noon, O king, I was on the road, and I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. And he said, And we fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. Now, Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew. I've been fortunate enough to study both languages. And it's very similar, but it's enough difference. But, but he's saying that was, a, that was the Hebrew or Aramaic, was the, the language of the day among the Jews. And, and, and if you read one, you can pretty much understand the other. Or if you speak one, you can pretty much understand the other. They do some weird things, like instead of putting the, the word the in front of the word, they put it behind the word. It's kind of a little confusing, but you kind of get a hang of what's going on. They're pretty similar. He said, but in, in my native language of Aramaic, he said, I, God spoke to me. He says, we all fell to the ground. I heard the voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. He said, this is hard, hard for you. What you're doing is you can't win. <laughs> you're going up against God. I like the next part. Then I ask, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord's reply. Now get up. And stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending, <clears throat> I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God, so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, sanctified means are, are made saints. <laughs> are made saints by me. Wow. There I was, 16 years old, and my friend said, what do you have to do to be saved? And I didn't know what to say. God says to the Apostle Paul, this is why I'm raising you up, so that you can remove the blinders from their eyes. I could have removed the blinders of his eye if I had just been prepared. I could have offered him the forgiveness of sins. I could have offered him to stop living in the kingdom of darkness and live in the kingdom of light. To stop living for Satan and living for God. But I wasn't prepared. You get the picture? Three times in the book of Acts, this story is told, and I often wondered and said to myself, why? I got it the first time he wrote it in the book of Acts. Why? You want to know the reason why? Because we don't just tell our story once. We should tell it all the time. All the time. All the time. So I'm going to tell you my story for the umpteenth time. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you my story. You remember how it was? I told you this on the first Sunday I came here. First Sunday I came. I grew up in the Berean Baptist Church of Detroit. It's on Five Mile Road, just off of Grand River uh, in, in Detroit, near the Southfield Expressway. All right? From the time I was two years old to the time I went to college at 18, 16 years, in my formative years, I went to the Berean Baptist Church of Detroit, Michigan. It was at the Berean Baptist Church of Detroit, Michigan, that they had Christian Service Brigade, which is kind of like Boy Scouts, only with a Christian application. And we had to memorize Bible verses. The second Bible verse I ever memorized was John 3.16, because the first one was Isaiah 53.6. And in John 3.16, how many here know it? You know it, come on. Everybody, you probably got it memorized. At least you've heard it before. You've seen it raised in the end zone, John 3.16. It'll probably happen today at both games and probably two weeks from now at the Super Bowl. Somebody will be there with John 3.16 raised up in the end zone. I memorized John 3.16, and as a result of memorizing those verses and a bunch of other verses, 
because that was a weekly assignment. I would memorize verses. I would memorize more verses than any of the other kids in the group. I don't know why. I didn't even know there was a contest going on. I want Honor Boy. Honor Boy was the one who memorized the most verses. The award was you get to go to Camp Kaskatawa. Now, Camp Kaskatawa was like our Camp Lael, only it was just for boys. And so I go to Camp Kaskatawa, and every night at Camp Kaskatawa, they have a bonfire. You wait till it gets dark. Now, in the summertime, you know, that's pretty late, so we're staying up late. We're, we're loving this, you know? And so the guy gets up, we sing songs, and, and, and then he gets up, and, and, and one of the leaders preaches, and that night it was the Reverend Elgin Green. We called him Cap Green because he was captain of the camp. Cap Green got up, and he told the story. That's what we call it, the story. That's what I'm talking, my story. He told the story. And when he told the story, at the end, it was like Billy Graham crusade. If you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior, raise your hand. I raised my hand. Another kid raised his hand. So there were two of us. He said, okay, at the close of this bonfire, you all go down to the pop shop. Well, the pop shop's where you got pop, candy, and goodies. But the two guys that raised their hand, you just stick around. What? We're going to miss pop shop? We did. We stuck around. He asked us, come down. So he did. We came down. And he opened up his Bible to John 3.16. And he said this, for God. He said, do you guys know who God is? Of course we did. God is our creator is what we said. He said, you got that right. So God's your creator. So love the world. Do you know who the world is? I said, yeah, I know who the world is. The other kid wasn't answering. He was kind of shy. I did all the talking. Do you imagine that? <laughs> I said, yeah, I know who the world is. It's everybody. He said, you got that right. And if it's everybody, he said, Dennis, does that include you? And I said, well, yeah. So he said, you can put your name in there, Dennis. For God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son. He said, do you know who that is? I said, yeah, that's Jesus. So, so he reread the verse, for God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. That if, that, that whosoever believes, he said, do you know who whosoever is? I said, this guy's just asking me too many questions. I said, no, I knew who it was, but I was tired of this guy drilling me. Come on, I, this is not the way it's supposed to go. He said, well, whoever is anybody who will believe? He said, Dennis, will you believe? I said, yes, I will believe. He said, so you can put your name in here. And he read the verse. For God, your creator, so loved you, Dennis, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that if Dennis believes in him, Dennis should not perish, but have everlasting life. He said, Dennis, will you believe in him and tell him so right now? I said, yes, I would. So would the other kid. And so right there at the campfire, the only light we had was what was coming from the fire. Open Bible to John 3, 16. We both prayed, and I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Eight years old. And you know what? He did. He came into my heart. I know it was real because the next day I went to the camp bookstore. And I bought with my own money a postcard. Now there's a story behind the postcard. You see, my mom had sent stationery for me to write her from camp. Self-addressed envelope with a stamp on it, the whole, whole nine yards. Only thing she didn't include was a pen. She probably did. I probably lost it. And, and I was supposed to write three pages she gave me. Three pages? Who's going to fill up three pages when you're eight years old? I was in a camp bookstore. I saw this postcard. I saw the other side that I only had to fill up that much space. I bought the postcard. I bought a stamp. Are you kidding me? So I went back. And, oh, along with the postcard... I bought a New Testament, my very first Bible that I bought. I still have this New Testament. The cover is gone. Who knows where that is? But I got all the pages. That's what really matters, isn't it? The Word of God. Yeah. I, I would carry that every week to church. I'd carry that to, to Christian Service Brigade Boys Club. I, that was my Bible, and, and I wore that thing out. I didn't read it much, but I sure carried it a lot because I was only eight years old, okay? A anyway, on the back side of the postcard, I wrote to my mom. Monday I took guns and I got 17 point. Forgot the S on the end of that, sorry about that. 
I, you know, I'm not the world's greatest speller. Some of you have noticed that by now. Thank God for spell check, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. I, sh- I needed it for that postcard. I took it. Now, I don't know if 17 points was a lot or a little. I mean, I mean if, if the goal was just 20 points, I did pretty well. If the goal was 100 points, I, I flunked. <laughs> Of course, the guns were BB guns, and I thought that was a big deal, right? BB gun, shooting BB guns at eight years old. It says, I'll send a letter later, or no, pretty soon. I'll send a letter pretty soon. And then it says, I got, now the next word was written, erased, written and erased. And I finally settled on, I got staved yesterday. S T. A-V-E-D. I got staved. I didn't even know how to spell it, but my mom knew what happened to me. She saved that postcard, and I still have it today. Yeah. I wrote home and told her all about it. I didn't know how much of a theologian I really was at eight years old. Because you know what? I really got it right. That was not misspelled. That was a providential guidance from God. Because the word stave, all that means is a board. A board. A stave company takes the law lum- lumber of logs, the raw lumber, and they run them through planers and cutters and they make staves out of them. They're a stave company. They make boards out of those. And the boards upon which Jesus was nailed are staves. So I got this theologically correct. For God so loved the world that he staved his only begotten Son. Paul says it like this, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. But I have been crucified with Christ. I died with Jesus. He was staved. I was saved. He saved me because I was staved with him. Wow. Isn't this marvelous? Yeah. This verse, I love this verse, because anyone can put their name in it. For God so loved, put your name in there. Say it. For God so loved, I didn't hear you say your name. For God so loved, that he gave his only begotten son, that if believes in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See how that works? You just have to believe. You just have to believe. And he will save you. He saved me eight years old, Four years later, in my last year at that camp, I came home, told the pastor, I need to be baptized. I learned that there's a connection. You get saved, you follow the Lord obedient in baptism. And so I got baptized with about eight other kids in the church. And uh, I got baptized at the Berean Baptist Church at 12 years old because I was saved. That's my story. I want to talk to you about your story, your story. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. He's telling you, you have a story. You have a story. And you need to be prepared to give an answer to anyone to ask you to give the reason of hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You have a story that only you can tell. You know, I want to go back to this just for a moment. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. Because of that incident, and something that happened a few weeks later, I had the incident with my friend Dennis. A few weeks later, our youth group decided we're going to visit on the kids who haven't been in attendance for a while. The adults did that at our church. They went out on visitation. That's what they call it, visitation. So those of us who could drive, we got together and we said, let's go visit the kids we haven't seen for a while. And so we drove to their homes. And this one home, we visited a kid by the name of Tim Gunning. And Tim was a Christian, but he had his buddy with him. He was not. We're talking about church and everything. And my friend, friend Bill, who had been to Denver Baptist High School, he knew how to share his faith. Next thing I know, he's whipping out a Bible. And he's going through the Romans road out of the scripture with this kid. This kid that's a friend of Tim's accepts Christ as his Savior. And I said to myself, duh, I could do that. So I went and got my Bible. And I went through those verses he did. And I marked them and I put a little note. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. 
Now I got the plan down. I know how to do this. I'm prepared. I'm more than prepared. I'm out hunting. <laughs> I'm looking for someone. I'm looking. I'm driving along, but I, I got to do a stranger because I don't want to do anybody I know, you know? And I'm driving down the road, and I'm, I see this guy on the side of the road hitchhiking. Remember the days when you did that? This guy's hitchhiking. I swerve by. I reach over to the passenger side, and I throw the door open. Now, I'm prepared. So I said, hop in if you don't mind riding with a religious fanatic. <laughs> see, I set it up. I get to tell him. He hops in the car, and I look at him. It's my friend Bill Crane. Ugh. My whole, I got derailed. I couldn't go any further. He said to me, what do you mean, a religious fanatic? I said, well, you know, we've got a really good youth group at church. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't. So I, I, he needs a ride. So I give him a ride all the way home. I pull into his driveway and drop him off. And, and, and I thought that would be the end of it. So the next day, I'm going to pick up my girlfriend to take her to work. And I'm, I'm driving down, I, I think it was Warren Avenue in Detroit, and and, and I see this kid hitchhiking, and it's Bill. <laughs> I swerve over and I pick him up again. I, this guy doesn't have a car, he's going everywhere. You can't even afford the bus? Come on now. And so, but, but he hops in, and, and now my girlfriend and I were talking about youth group. He's in the back seat, and we're talking about youth group and all this. And, and so I go and I drop my girlfriend off, and, and he jumps out of the back seat, hops in the front seat, you know, riding shotgun. And, and so, uh, he, he, we start talking again, and, and, and finally I just, okay, I got to do it. And I said to Bill, I said, Bill, are you a Christian? He says, no, but I'm going to be. That was not in my game plan. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean you're going to be? He says, I'm going to be as soon as you tell me how. About that time, I was not too far from my house. I pulled up in the driveway, pulled into the backyard by the garage. There's nobody around, and... and I have this Bible in my back seat of the car. I pull it out, and I show him how. And Bill prays in the shotgun position of the car and asks Jesus to come into his heart and save him as Lord and Savior. I then take him home. He comes to youth group and brings his brother. His brother gets saved. His brother then says, we ought to bring our sisters. Brings two sisters along. They get saved. Parents start and think, what kind of cult are my kids in? They come to church, they get saved. The whole family gets baptized. You know what? All because I was prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within me. You can be prepared too. See, you have a story that only you can tell best. You know what? Paul can't tell my story that well. I can't tell Paul's story that well. I try, but there's just no way I could tell the Apostle Paul's story like he could tell it. Nobody can tell your story like you can tell it. That's so important, so important. So you need to go and tell your story. That's all you got to do. Go and tell your story. You just tell them how God saved you. Now, I know some of you are saying, but I need help telling my story. What do you mean you need help? Yeah, you need help. You need help. I'm at a deacon's meeting that the deacon said, uh, said to me, one of the deacons says, uh, could you help us share the gospel? You know, you do it, so would you just help us share? I said, sure I will. And, and so uh, I said, what we'll do is we'll just spend a few weeks doing my story. And so we all sat down and uh, we had a meeting and, and we gave a simple assignment, go read and, and, and pick out a story that matches yours from the Bible. They only about got a story that matched them from the Bible. And it came back. Now you've got to integrate your story with that story. And then they integrated it with their story. And then we supplemented it with some verses. And as a result, they all, all of them, uh, wrote their stories. And you have them in your bulletin today as an insert. Those are their... I can't tell that story as well as they tell it. It's not my story. It's their story. So if they could learn to tell their story... You can learn to tell your story. And I'll tell you what, it gets better all the time. Every time you tell it, it gets better. You say, how does that happen? Well, two ways. Some people embellish it. I don't want you to do that. But you get practiced at it. You get practiced at it. And you know how to tell it. You know how to tell your story. Listen, if you need help telling your story, I will help you. 
in the lobby, there's a sheet of paper that says my story on it. You just write your name on there and you put uh, how you want me to contact you, I will contact you. And we will go over one-on-one, -on -one, or if there's a group of you that want to do it, we'll get together as a group, and, and we'll go over how I can tell my story so I am prepared to give every man the reason of hope that lies within me. I don't want you to be like I was with my friend Dennis, whom I never, ever got another opportunity to tell. I missed the opportunity. But you have a story that you can tell. You just need to tell it. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the gospel story, good news. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again, all according to the scriptures. Indeed, that is good news because he did that. We can have eternal life in him. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us so that we are sharing our stories effectively because we're prepared. Now, Lord, if there's someone here who says, you know, I, I, I don't even know that I have the story like you have to tell, maybe today they would just pray, Lord, come into my heart and save me from my sins because I believe you died, were buried, and rose again, all according to the scriptures. It's the faith in you, Lord, that saves. That's the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing, we are justified, declared to be righteous in your sight, pardoned and forgiven. And so give that assurance to the one who prays that prayer. Help the rest of us, Lord, to share that story, even this week. And those who need help, that they just sign up and say, help me with my story. And for surely, Lord, we will. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen.